everyone. Oh, this is great. Oh, I missed you guys last week. Welcome. Yay. Just getting a few last things ready for demo. Yeah. So great to see everyone. Hi, Cyrus. All right. Let's see. It's almost 12 noon Pacific here in Los Angeles, and I will get going as soon as I see it go from 11.59 to 12. I hope you had a great holiday weekend. Let me know where you're logging on from, and we are ready to Let's get started. Hi everyone again. Thank you so much for joining me. This is The Dough Doctor. I'm your chef, baking expert, and host, Chef Colette, and we are gonna have a packed half hour of questions and demo. Hi Randy. Oh, it's great to see you guys. Mrs. C is here. Well, first off, what I want to what I, um, oh, Salzburg, oh, awesome. All right, deep yoga breath. Ah, all right, everyone. First thing I'd like to share with you guys is that I'm so glad we're back, even though last week was a lovely, relaxing weekend, and I hope you had a great, restful weekend or holiday weekend, whatever you did. I hope it was fun. Mine was, I spent most of the weekend swimming, which is my, one of my passions, so it was great. Um, all right, but in the two weeks that we were off, I thought a lot about summer baking and how our baking kind of dies down a little bit in the summer. So, you know, what can, what can we do to kind of keep going, but at the same time not heat up the house or, you know, um, take precious moments away from being outside? Because many of us live in, in, you know, places that have winter and we're stuck inside part of the year. So being mindful about that. And then Mrs. C texted me about peri-breast, all right? And peri-breast is a classic French pâte à choux-based dessert, and pâte à choux is the same dough that we use to make eclairs, which you all know about, and cream puffs, which are yummy, but it can also be made savory. Now, unless you kind of grew up with a, with a family member who made it, or you maybe had it, you know, body clairs in a bakery, it's not one as bakers that we usually think of. But Mrs. C made me think about it. And the dessert she was referencing is a little on the challenging side. So I thought, let's crawl before we walk, and that's why today's demo is Gougeres. And I have some right here. Right there. The original cheese puff. Magical puffs of this pâte à choux with Parmesan cheese and black pepper. So that's going to be our demo. Just going to stick this down here. But first, I'm going to answer the questions that came in, all right? And the questions that came in over, there really weren't a lot while we were on vacay, but I did get some yesterday and uh, this week. So let me just grab my phone, pull up Instagram, and we're going we're gonna, to, I mean, I basically have them memorized. I've been working on my memory a lot, so... Uh, Anyhow, I basically have them memorized, but I don't want to miss anybody. All right. So I had a really great question about, do I take temperatures um, when I bake bread? 
do I take finished internal bake temperatures? And the answer is, yeah, I do, because we need to know when our bread is baked. And there's, you know, there's a lot of opinions out there about what is the internal temperature of a finished loaf of bread. And I'll tell you my opinion, and I have strong opinions on this, because if we go too low, then, our, then we haven't baked out the excess moisture in our yeasted dough. And I don't care what you're making, you guys, if you're making brioche or honey oat bread or lovely little hamburger buns, any yeasted dough is going to, it's at least 60% water, so it's going to hold on to that hydration. So we have to bake that out not until it's dry, just until the excess moisture is baked out. So when I saw this question drop in, I was like, hallelujah. And let me just check, hold on here. Let me just go back. I can find it. Probably not, because when you're trying to do things live, you just can't. Um, so you're going to use an instant read thermometer and buy yourselves a good one. I was buying, I was on a tear where I was cheap, cheap, cheap. And I was spending like $12 on Amazon for these things. And I was going through them like water. So for just a little bit more, you can get a good one. The really great one is the Thermapen. Now, the Dough Doctor is not sponsored by Thermapen. I wish we were. Thermapen, if you're watching. But it's an awesome instant read thermometer that, you know, could last for years. But it does run about $99. All right, here's my mid-level instant read thermometer. So, for bread bakers out there, you want one of these in your toolbox because you want to be able to take the temperature of the water or liquid when you're mixing and maybe if you're feeling super advanced take the dough temperature when it comes off the mixer but the question was about internal temperature when is it done 205 to 210 now rye bread can be 200 but be careful you drop below 200 and you end up with a doorstop. And if anybody had grandmas and grandpas baking bread in the 70s, you know heavy bread because that was the era of back to the land and inflation and, and um, uh, conservation. A lot of bread baking going on in the 70s and a lot of heavy bread because bakers were not baking out um, excess moisture. That's kind of when I took my first bread baking class in high school and Mrs. Borelli, she beat it into our heads that we weren't baking doorstops. So, if you don't have one of the, these, you're gonna get your oven mitts and you're gonna pick up your loaf of bread when you think it's done and remember, if you're baking a loaf or a boule, that sucker's going to take at least 30 minutes, so don't pull it too soon. And you want to pick it up, and it should feel relatively light. Now, all of you watching have great baker's instincts. So, listen to that inner baker's voice. If it feels heavy, put it back in the oven for five to seven more minutes and then check again, all right? So wonderful question. That was just a great question and I was very grateful. Um, so now, the next question was relative to our demo today and it was all about baking pot de choux and not over baking pot de choux. And that's why making the gougeres first is such a good idea. Number one, they're a quick bake. You bake them start to finish. 
the the bet the dough could sit in the fridge for a little while if something happens but basically it's a 45 minute exercise so you know doesn't take you away from the outside very much and uh, it's a relatively 20 minute bake that the oven 20 maybe 25 depending on your oven um, uh, so not too bad and before I sail into demo one of our bakers let me know this is one of our baker Randy she got a new oven this week and the thermostat is digital it is a bright shiny gorgeous new oven so I just send out love and congratulations because bakers we know when we get a new oven, it's a wonderful thing. So shout out, yay! All right, now I'm gonna sail into demo. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna turn on your oven, new or old, to 375 degrees. So my oven is on. And you know, we always wanna like set ourselves up for success Turn the oven on, get your equipment ready, line your pans. Now, I really try to not make you guys draw circles or lines or anything. I try to keep it sweet and simple. I'm a big fan of folding. So you're going to be piping blocks of dough onto a piece of parchment paper. All right? So... How do we know where to go? Because sometimes when we're piping, we don't pipe straight. So you're gonna take a piece of parchment paper and you're gonna fold it uh, in half and then in half again. And if you have an offset spatula, whoops, haha. <laughs> I did also realize over the two weeks that I am blind. So uh, I'm wearing my glasses so I can actually read what you guys write. All right, here we go. So now I have folded it long ways into four. And then we're going to fold it, take the strip, and we're going to fold this into thirds. Now the recipe and the uh, the recipe will be uh, on my website bakingwithcolette.com by Monday morning. So see, we have squares as a guide. Oh, and it's going to make about thirty of these totally yummy morsels. All right, so the pan's ready. You do not need a piping tip, but if you have piping tips, you're going to grab an 806 and might as well set up your bag. This is a disposable piping bag, but I tend to wash these in hot soapy water, rinse them in the hottest water I can, and I re dry them over a bottle and reuse them. So, I know we always talk about sustainable baking, but um, uh, so I don't want you to think like I've lost my mind and I'm throwing out piping bags left, right, and center. Hi, Chef, Chef Wendy. Chef Wendy's here. Yay! And Pistol Packing Mama, one more comment. She's got a great comment about a new oven. She says in her family, the first thing you bake in the new oven is bread. That sounds kind of like a blessing. That's awesome. All right, let's recap our gougeres. One, oven is turned on. Two, pan is prepared. Piping bag is fitted with the tip, but you don't need the tip if you don't, if you don't have one, don't sweat it, all right? So the reason this, I think we don't gravitate to pot to shoe as bakers just kind of naturally is because this dough starts on the stove. So, and this is a relatively small recipe. 
because these are served as little snacks, as little appetizers with cocktails, with wine, and so you don't need a ton of them. Leftovers can be frozen and then thawed or re and then thawed and refreshed in a 350 degree oven for a few minutes and they come right back. All right. So I have a saucepan and in the saucepan I'm putting water, butter, sugar and salt. Now it's just a tablespoon of sugar so it's not going to make these savory cheese puffs sweet but what it does is it helps that little bit of sugar helps them take on that pretty color. It's called caramelization. Alright, so recap. Water, butter, sugar, salt on a, on a high flame to melt the butter on uh, medium-high, whatever you're comfortable with. And we're going to uh, bring this to a low rolling, and I mean rolling, boil. The butter has to melt so that it's not sitting on the top like a grease spill. Okay? All right. And then I have already prepared eggs, bread flour. You know, there's controversy about all-purpose. You could use all-purpose or bread, but I find bread flour, if you have it, um, will give them a little bit, of, little bit more structure. And then I have an ounce of grated Parmesan cheese. You can use any dry cheese. You just don't want to use government cheese. You don't want to use oily cheese, you know, um, like comes in the blocks. Um, you want to use, uh, you can use Parmesan, Grana Padana. You could use like a nice Kerrygold dry cheddar would be yummy. But if the cheese has a lot of moisture, then these have problems, okay? Kerrygold, did I say that? Kerrygold is an excellent choice. All right. And I wasn't throwing shade at government cheese, but you guys know what I mean, the, the logs of cheese. Really great to have for sandwiches, but, you know, not, not, for, not for everything. I, for one, really like Velveeta. Not that I eat Velveeta, but I love it. I think about it. Yeah. All right. So this is going to come up to a boil, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. And the other thing you need is... Hmm. That's the ovens come up to temperature. If you have a wooden spoon that looks like this, you know, kind of like a paddle, this would be a great choice. But a regular heat-proof spoon or spatula will work too. All right, so now I've come up to a rolling boil. You guys can see that. And right away, I'm gonna turn down the heat. Remember, you're the boss of your stove. If it feels like it's too hot and boiling too hard, you just turn it down. There's my bread flour all at once. And then we're going to stir until it lumps up like mashed potatoes. You want to stir fast. You really want to, really, it's a great workout. It's an excellent, uh, great for your upper arms. Whoopsie. All right. I'm actually going to put it back on the heat. And we're going to cook it for like a minute, just until we see a layer of starch on the bottom of our pot. Oh, BTW, best not to use a non-stick pan for this 
because you won't be able to see the starch on the bottom. Yeah, that's it. And these are delicious. People love them. So can you see that, bakers? See that starch on the bottom? That's what we're looking for. All the ingredients are combined, and they look kind of like yellow mashed potatoes. Be pretty thick mashed potatoes, but you guys know what I mean. I think it always helps to have a texture reference. All right, so now we're going to grab the mixer bowl. This can be done by hand, but it's pretty 17th century, so I recommend if you have um, a mixer, use it. And as Chef Daniel used to always say, I think I saw him in the audience, if Escoffier would have had electricity in mixers, he certainly would have used them. So you guys use your mixers. You could use a handheld too if that's what you have. All right, so the hot flour, butter, sugar, salt, water mixture is in the mixer bowl. And I'm going to start on low speed. And I'm going to mix this. Well, I start on low because I want to make sure it's not going to hit me in the face. And then I'm going to turn it up a little bit. And just mix it until the steam dissipates. But we want the mixture to be a little bit warm because the eggs will go in uh, more easily, all right? Now that's something that's like a pro tip that, especially in a dough like this, if the base is a little bit warm and we're adding eggs, it really helps them combine well. I did not learn that as a young baker. I learned it in an advanced class with an amazing pastry chef. His name is Stefan Treon, and he has a lovely bakery down in Newport Beach. So if you're in SoCal, SoCal go to, no, Costa Mesa, Costa Mesa. So how long do you mix? Kind of scoot down. And look for steam. If there's no more steam, I mean, you can also, if you're really worried about it, you can stick your knuckle in there, and it should not burn you. I'll go about 30 more seconds for good measure. And you'll notice my eggs are mixed. And the thing about this pot to choux formula, I have chefs in the audience, I have students in the audience, you're not going to have to guess with the amount of eggs. Because when we're baking alone, and there's, that's a drag. So it'll say three large eggs, I'll have the weight there for those of you who have your own chickens, and the weights vary, but um, pretty much this works perfectly every time with three large eggs. You're welcome. On low speed, I'm adding my eggs. Add half and then turn up the speed. You're going to need a spatula. Let me show you what it looks like since I don't have an overhead camera. So it looks um, kind of lumpy but I wanted it to come together just a little bit. And now I'm gonna go ahead, give it one scrape down with the mixer off. And then we're gonna add the rest of the eggs.
that was a little fast. A slow and st steady stream is a good idea. And now I'm going to turn it up and let it mix for about a minute. If you think you need to scrape down, again, that inner baker's voice, trust your intuition. You guys are good. This is actually a smaller a, a smaller recipe of the uh, recipe that is in my Craftsy class, French Pastry Shop Classics, where I go into a whole huge demo that's available on Craftsy. So if you're like, oh, I want to see this in detail, that's where you want to go. And I'll have those links in Monday's posts. All right. So you see, you could do this by hand, but your arm would be falling off right about now. Alright, so let me show you what this looks like. It is, it looks really, really good. And for my chefs and my former culinary students in the office, in the, in the office, right, in the audience, you'll remember, and, and everyone else, the classic test is called the string test. You take a blob of the batter or dough in between your thumb and forefinger and you stretch it. And you stretch it about a couple inches. And if, it's, if it looks just like this, guess what? It's perfect. If it separates, then you need to add more egg. But you're never going to stretch your fingers more than this. All right? This is perfect. So that's, I, I just had to, I just absolutely had to figure it out. Because guessing with the eggs is a drag. Cheese is going in. This is Trader Joe's Full Disclosure Parmesan. And if you like a few grinds of pepper, this is my adorable pepper mill. Her name is Bonnie. And then I'm just going to just paddle it in, just get the cheese in. If anybody names their tools or mixers, please put it in the comments so I don't feel insane. Well, wow. crazy. Okay. So now that the cheese and black pepper are in, you're going to fold back the collar of the bag. If you don't have a pastry bag, you can use a gallon size Ziploc bag and cut off a corner. But I would guess most of you have... Uh, at least one piping bag in your collection of kitchen things. Okay, all right. It's thick, so you're not going to overfill the bag because that really stresses out your hand as you're piping. Okay. All right, we're almost done, and I have them, as you saw, I have them already baked, so I'm just going to show you the piping and throw them in the oven. Okay, now, because the batter's thick, there's one pre-step you have to do. You have to pipe a little bit on the pan, just like that. See? So that the parchment paper sticks. Otherwise, every time you pipe, the paper will fly up. 
Okay, I'm going to start here and go to here, and then I'm going to spin the pan. All right? So these, the other beautiful thing about gougeres, they don't care how you pipe them. You could make a beehive and they'll work. But the, truly the best way is squeeze for a count of three and then do a curly, just squeeze to a count of three, release pressure, slide off. Squeeze to a count of three, release pressure, and slide off. If you're more skilled, you can squeeze to a count of three and give the, give the bag a half twirl and that will help you end cleanly. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The main thing is to not have pressure on the bag when you're trying to release pressure as you finish piping. These are super old school, but they're really delicious. And even your guests who are super disciplined, oh, they won't be able to help themselves. And we did this all within our short show time, not counting the baking time. Now you're looking at tails and you're thinking, oh my God, what do I do about the tails? Well, I'll show you. No egg wash, nothing like that. Oh, I'm done with the glasses. Okay, you take a little bit of water. I have a little bit of water in this teeny tiny Mies cup and you just touch the tops. You can, if you're feeling like you want more cheese, you can sprinkle a little cheese, more cheese on the top. But I would advise, don't get too carried away. So fun. I don't know what gougeres mean. I don't think it means anything in particular. But um, there they are, before they're baked. And then once again, there they are after they're baked. Now, Don Deco, she asked, she, I, I think our baker, I think that's correct. Um, our baker, Don Deco, asked about how to not bake them, uh, so over bake them. Well, the thing with these, at this size, they are, they're going to take about 20 minutes at 375. So when you open them up, they're not eggy, but they're nice and soft, and it's like one or two bites of just deliciousness, and really lovely with um, cocktails, wine, or a lovely seltzer with some lime. lime. And, as I said, I know I'm repeating myself, but you can bake them, let them cool to room temperature, bag them, freeze them, and then just let them thaw. There's nothing to them. They'll thaw in no time. Lay them out on a baking tray, 350 for five minutes, and they'll come right back. For anybody who's a boomer or late boomer, if your parents had cocktail parties, these were served. And Another thing you can do before we go, if you're really feeling it, you can stuff them. You can stuff them with like a lovely herby cream cheese mousse or crab salad. Yeah, these were, uh, there's a lot you can do with these. You could pipe them teeny tiny and use them as croutons on a salad. That's it. I'm all out of ideas for this hour. But I cannot thank you. I'm just going to leave it there. Bakers, thank you so much for joining me. Please keep thinking up those questions. Message me, DM me, put them on Friday's post, 
and we'll have another terrific show next week. So thank you so much for joining me. Please tag me in your bakes. I saw some beautiful emerald cupcake bakes. Los Angeles sent me the most gorgeous pomegranate pie. I wish I wasn't so low tech so I could have your bakes on a big screen behind me. Maybe someday. Thanks you guys for joining me. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. See you next week.